Well, welcome to another Friday night. We're doing a little series on what's a healthy relationship look like. That's part of what we need to learn in reparenting ourselves and parenting our children is how to have a healthy relationship, how to be a good friend. And part of a healthy relationship and what we want to look at today and next week is conflict. And conflict is something that causes a lot of anxiety for people from complex trauma. But conflict is actually designed, it's a normal part of a relationship. It's just part of two people being in a more intimate relationship together. And so conflict was actually designed to be a good thing. It highlights issues so that you can resolve them, so that the relationship can grow and become stronger and better. And so conflict is designed to be something that is very positive in the end. Now, having said that, it's important to understand up front that the goal of conflict, and this is key, is not that you win the conflict. The goal of conflict is Number one, that you understand each other. And then number two, try to resolve it. And many times it is resolvable, sometimes it's not. But you start with the goal of understanding each other and then in resolving it. And so to do that, there's really two key things that are needed. You need the right attitudes and tools. Now, in the past, I've done some talks on conflict, and I don't want to go back through all of that. And so I don't want to focus again on a lot of the stuff that I've covered around complex trauma and conflict and attitudes in conflict, but I want to just highlight this. Conflict is only positive. Conflict is only resolvable if both people have the attitude of humility. And that means that both people are willing to change. Both people are willing to own their part. If you have a relationship where one person is willing to change and own their part, but the other person is not, conflict will never be a good thing. It will never be resolved in a healthy way. And so the attitude is foundational. Humility. But secondly, there's just very practical tools that are necessary in order to resolve a conflict well. And so I want to give some very, very practical tools this time. In the past, I've given some more big picture, general tools. I want to break it down even further this week and next into some very practical tools. But before we do that, Let me just, again, give the background of how does complex trauma affect our approach to conflict. So complex trauma basically causes your perspective to change on conflict so that in your eyes it's not a good thing, it's a bad thing. And that's because in healthy conflict, as you understand each other, you find a way to resolve it and grow from it. But what happens in complex trauma is it's not resolved. Well, it sometimes is resolved in the sense that the person in authority gets their own way and everybody else just has to stuff their needs, stuff their emotions and give in. There's a winner and a loser because it's superior, inferior relationships. And who's ever in a position of superiority or power wins. Everybody else loses. But they don't just lose the conflict. The person in power then punishes them. The person in power then shames them, then rubs their nose in it. And so conflict doesn't improve anything. Conflict keeps the problems unresolved, but then adds more pain and more painful stuff. And so conflict always results in negative. And therefore, that leads to 
the necessary sur survival response of a child in that kind of home is if you can't resolve it, your only way to survive in it is fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response. And that's what most of you have learned. So if there's any hint of conflict, you don't even think of tools to resolve it. You think of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. So let me just show you what that looks like. Flight and fawn is basically avoid conflict at all cost or peace at any price. So you give in, you take the blame, you try to make the other person happy, even if that means denying your needs, if that means making yourself smaller. You avoid the issue, you minimize the issue. So it's avoid, avoid, avoid conflict because you can't have conflict. But then if that doesn't work and you end up in conflict, oh, oh, it's get the conflict to end as quickly as possible. So you don't try to resolve it. You just kiss and make up. You take the blame. You don't talk about it again. So you go to fawning. You go to avoid. That's the normal response for many of you. Some of you have gone to the fight response. You're big, you're intimidating, and so you get angry at me. Well, I'm going to trump your anger, and I'm going to overpower you, and I'm going to shut you down, so I always win. Some of you, that looks like you hurt me once, you're out of my life. I will not try to resolve it. I will not put up with you any longer. I'm done with you. You get one chance, and if you hurt me, there's no resolution possible, you're ghosted. So that is the normal response when you grow up in complex trauma. Because conflict never has led to anything good. It has only led to pain. Therefore, avoid it or always win. That needs to change. That perspective number one needs to change where you see conflict is only bad you need to begin to realize while conflict can actually lead to good stuff it can be resolved and then secondly from using the tools of fight flight freeze or fawn to saying no let's learn other tools so that we can begin to resolve conflict that's what we're going to be beginning to do today so tool number one, how we introduce conflict is essential. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about one of the warning signs that a relationship is breaking down. And so one of the warning signs is that instead of a soft start to a discussion, you come in with a harsh start, accusing, angry, dysregulated, demeaning, all of those things. And so how you start a conflict goes a long way in determining how that conflict is going to go and whether it's going to be resolved. If you start it really harsh, your chances of it going well diminish greatly. Your chances of it being resolved diminish greatly. And so you have to begin to realize how I introduce the topic, how I start it is super important because that will determine whether or not the person goes to immediate defensiveness or whether they're open to talking about it. And so there's soft start tools that are so necessary. So w one of the things we talked about is complaint versus criticism. So complaint is there's an issue we need to talk about based on an event that has happened. Criticism is globally maligning, attacking their character. So instead of saying, in this situation, here's what happened, I'm not happy about it, criticism says, you're a loser, you always mess this up. It attacks the person. So part of soft start is complaint 
not criticism. The next thing is soft start requires emotional regulation. You have to get yourself to a calm place to talk about it. If you talk about it from an escalated, dysregulated place, the chances of it going well are not good. So let me give you just some soft start statements that help in getting it off to a good start. So there's an issue, and you might say, I know this isn't all your fault. I know I play a role in this as well. So my goal here is not to blame you totally. My goal is to help us understand what's going on here. So you're up front really making clear, I know I've got a part and you've got a part. All I want to do is figure out what's going on instead of an attack, a blame type of thing. So in other words, if you're willing and it's known up front to take responsibility for your part, to own your part, it has a wonderful softening effect. If your focus is entirely getting them to own your part and minimizing your part, it will shut things down. Now let me just add this. A lot of people use what I've just said. I know this isn't all your fault. I know I have some fault. But then they go, but. And what you begin to realize is they're using that phrase as a way to manipulate. Because what happens when they hit the but is they try to make it all your fault. They totally go against what they just said, that I know that some of this is my fault. And so be careful if somebody's using that phrase that they're not using it in a manipulative way, a hypocritical way. They need to be able to follow it with, here's what I think is my part, here's what I think is your part. There's another statement that helps people, and it's when you did that, here's how it affected me, here's how it made me feel. So when you did that, I felt very disrespected. I felt like you don't care about me. That helps because now it's not just an accusation. It's saying this is my perception of what just happened and how it affected me. Can we talk about it? Or you can say there's something going on that I'm really struggling with and I'd like to be able to talk about it. So again, you're introducing it from, I'm struggling, and that can help soften the whole thing. So here's some just general, general guidelines when you are wanting to soften an argument or conflict. Number one, make sure it's always respectful. One very important rule is no disrespect. Even though you're angry, no shot taking, no name calling. That will shut an argument, conflict down quickly. Keep it respectful. Secondly, begin by describing what is happening. Don't begin by just judging. Paint the picture of what is happening. That is so important. Complain, like we said, about a specific thing, but don't go to blame. So let's say you get a new dog, and you say, okay, we're going to share the picking up of dog poop, and you come home at the end of the week, and there's been no dog poop picked up. Now, you can go to blame. Why haven't you picked up dog poop? Or you can say, okay, we made an agreement. We're going to pick up dog poop. There's nothing been picked up. We need to talk this out and sort it out and figure out how we're going to handle this. So that takes the attack out of it. That says, I've got a part in this. We need to figure out either a schedule or how this is going to work. Just that helps not go to this shutting down defensive posture. Another thing is, be polite. Use please. So use things like, 
I would appreciate if you would do picking up the dog poop on these days. Could you do that, please? All of those things, instead of demanding, it helps so much. It softens it. Use I statements as much as possible instead of you accusatory statements. So I feel, or I would appreciate, or this would mean a lot to me. Instead of you don't do this right, you didn't do this. All of that is so important. And then be clear. Don't expect your partner to be a mind reader. So just say we agreed to pick up the poop. You should have known I wanted you to pick it up Monday to Friday, and I do the weekends. Be clear. That is so important. So those are some guidelines that it can help. Now let me back you up and paint a bigger picture here. Conflict is a normal part of relationship. It is a necessary part of relationship. It can be a very good part of relationship. But you want to be careful that there's a balance between times of conflict and times of just enjoying each other and fun and encouragement and positive connection. If you have too much conflict where you're always in fights, that's going to wear each other down. That's going to make the relationship start to feel unsafe, not enjoyable, be lack of connection, and it's going to take its toll on the relationship. If you have a relationship where you're focusing too much on complaint, you're not doing this right. In this situation, you didn't do this right, but you don't have enough encouragement. I really appreciated when you did this. That's going to put the relationship in a more negative place, a more negative environment. And so what is important to realize is a relationship is creating an environment that is real. But that takes work and that takes a balance. Yes, there's going to be conflict, but we need to build into our relationship appreciation, encouragement, times of fun, times of really good connection to balance out the other stuff. So keep that in mind. Secondly, a lot of people only have conflict when stuff blows up. So they don't talk about stuff. They don't talk about issues. They kind of avoid issues, stuff them a little bit. But then the pressure builds, and then there's a blow up, and then there's a conflict. That's not the most ideal type of conflict. That will happen. You can't avoid some of that. But you can avoid a lot of that blow-up type conflict by choosing to address issues regularly in the relationship before they blow up. And so I would encourage you to have a time once a week where you just say, this is our time to talk about some issues. Now, again, you've got to make sure that's balanced with times in the week where you're enjoying each other, where you're encouraging each other, where you're truly connecting. But you do need a regular time where you can air some beefs that you have in the relationship. So some call it beefs and bouquets is a necessary part of every week in a relationship. You got to have the bouquets where you give them the flowers and the nice things that are encouraging and positive, but you have to allow for beefs as well. And so build that in. So learn how to communicate about some of those beefs. So if one of your beefs is, I'm doing all the taxi driving for the kids, you're lazy. No, don't do that. Instead of saying, okay, we got a bit of a problem here with the taxing of the kids. And I'm feeling a little bit like I'm doing 90% of it. And I'm, not, I'm feeling used. It's not feeling fair to me. Can we talk about this so that we can come up with a schedule that works for both of us? And it feels fair. So you approach it in a way that is constructive problem-solving.
in a way that is not blaming, accusing, but how can we work this out so we accomplish a healthy family? Something else is, is this an issue that my partner's doing stuff that's unloving, or is this an issue based on just my partner isn't like me? So maybe you're neat, they're not so neat. Maybe you're very organized, they're kind of ditzy. So that's just who they are. So is this issue an issue that they can change, or is this just part of who they are that I need to learn to accept? Take that further. Let's say you grew up in a home where your mom had this neat, super neat household, and that was the standard you were raised with. That was the normal. So the minute you get in the house, you take your shoes off. Everything is constantly tidied up. Your bedroom has to be neat all the time. Nothing on the floor. Organized desk. Bed made. All of that. Your partner, they come from a home where it's much more lax. There's dishes left on the counter sometimes. Beds are kind of half made. There's a few things on the floor. Doesn't bother them. That's not hurting anybody. And so you get together and all of a sudden you're getting annoyed constantly with their tidiness standard. But that's not necessarily they're doing anything wrong. It's just different than you, the standards you were raised with. So part of what you have to figure out in conflict is, is this truly an issue, or is this an issue based on my upbringing, based on my personality, and I just need to learn to accept my partner? Okay, let's go to tool number two. And this one is so important, because conflicts tend to cause us to escalate emotionally because it's about a problem it's it's there's some intensity to it there's some differences of opinion there's some anger and so we need tools to de-escalate de and get emotionally regulated before we even start the conflict but then we need tools to regulate our emotions and de-escalate if they start to escalate in the middle of a conflict that is so important. And then part of that is in a conflict, what can happen is if we start to escalate, then we can get off track. We can get off onto other issues. And so we have to figure out how to help each other stay on track, on point, and how to take breaks in a conflict if it's breaking down, if we're dysregulating, if we're getting off track and we don't know how to get off track, if we hit a roadblock and we don't know how to get beyond that to resolve the issue. So we need tools to do that. So let me just begin with a couple questionnaires around this emotional dysregulation stuff. So true or false? Number one, our discussions get too heated. Number two, I have a hard time calming down. Three, one of us is going to say something we regret. Four, my partner gets too upset. Five, after a fight, I want to keep my distance. Six, my partner yells unnecessarily. Seven, I feel overwhelmed by our arguments. Eight, I can't think straight when my partner gets hostile. Nine, why can't we talk more logically? 10. My partner's negativity often comes out of nowhere. 11. There's no stopping my partner's temper. 12. I feel like running away during our fights. 13. Small issues suddenly become big ones. 14. I can't calm down very easily during an argument. 15. My partner has a long list of unreasonable demands. So, one for every true answer. 
So if below six, flooding, emotionally getting dysregulated isn't uh, an issue, but if it's higher than six, then this flooding, emotional dysregulation is something that is becoming a problem and is hindering the effectiveness of being able to resolve your conflicts very well. Okay, another questionnaire, and this is around during the conflict if you're starting to escalate. One, we are good at taking breaks when we need them. Two, my partner usually accepts my apologies. Three, I can say that I am wrong. Four, I'm pretty good at calming myself down. Five, we can maintain a sense of humor, even in conflict. Six, when my partner says we should talk to each other in a different way, it usually makes a lot of sense. Seven, my attempts to repair our discussions when they are negative are usually effective. Eight, we are pretty good listeners, even when we have different positions on things. Nine, if things get heated, we can usually pull out of it and change things. Ten, my partner is good at soothing me when I get upset. Eleven, I feel confident that we can resolve most issues between us. Twelve, when I comment on ways in which we could communicate better, my partner listens to me. Thirteen, even if things get hard at times, I know we can get past our differences. Fourteen, we can be affectionate even when we are disagreeing. Fifteen, teasing and humor usually work to get my spouse over negativity. Sixteen, we can start a conflict all over again if it starts to break down and improve our discussion. Seventeen, when emotions run hot, expressing how upset I feel makes a real difference. Eighteen, we can discuss even big differences between us. Nineteen, my partner expresses appreciation for nice things I do. And twenty, even or if I keep trying to communicate, it will eventually work. So again, one for each true answer, 13 or higher. Being able to regulate yourself in the middle of a conflict when it's starting to dysregulate is a strength of your relationship. Under 13, an area of potential weakness. Therefore, an area that's hindering your ability to resolve conflict. So let me... Now go to some very practical tools. If you're starting to dysregulate, number one, communicate to each other that you need to take a break. So communicate in a way that says, I want to come back to this and continue this conversation I'm not running away, I'm not avoiding, I just need to calm down, get out of my limbic brain, back into my cortex, so that I can think this through better, and then I will return. So figure out ways to communicate that to each other. It is so important. Secondly, apologize immediately for anything you have done that has made things worse. So if you, oh, sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that. that I said that too harshly or sorry, I, I'm starting to get emotionally dysregulated and, and it's affecting you. And, and I apologize for kind of lashing out a bit. Immediate apology, so important. Sometimes stop and just say, okay, let's just get the right perspective on this discussion again. We're both getting heated but let's remind ourselves we're on the same team. This isn't a win-lose situation. We're just working together trying to find a solution to this issue. Sometimes reframing it is helpful. Sometimes a hug. And that helps keep your hearts open. You, don't, you just communicate, I love you, we're going to work this through. I'm here for you. All of that is so important. You're not saying anything. You're not trying to 
make a point, you're just holding each other to create safety, a sense of love. Those can be important. Next, train each other to know when you need to take a break. So if you realize, okay, I'm starting to feel my pulse go up, I'm starting to feel my face get red, all of that, okay, that's, that's not a good sign. I need to take a break. So look for the warning signs of I'm escalating to a point that is not good. And learn how to help each other identify those points so that you know when to take a break. Next one is learn to know how to tell when you help each other know when you need a corrective measure. So a corrective measure is we're getting off topic or we're emotionally dysregulating. We need to correct that. We're getting off topic. We need to get back on topic. You're deflecting from owning your stuff. You're minimizing your part. We need corrective measures. So learn how to say to each other, okay, we got a problem here. I think you're deflecting. That is such an important thing to talk through, to have ground rules for, to have cues for. So with that, understand that those are corrective measures are repair attempts. And sometimes we don't always say them perfectly. So sometimes we can say, you're minimizing. Now that can come across in the un- conflict, that can come across sounding a bit harsh. And the other person can get offended by that. So understand this, don't get wrapped up in the delivery at this point. Hear what they're saying, even if they didn't say it perfectly. You can come back later to how they delivered it, but at that moment, you need to be able to hear a corrective, restorative, repair attempt is being made. That's the issue, not how it was delivered. Some people find it important to have a scripted phrases prepared that they can use when a conflict is starting to get dysregulated. Now let me say up front is a lot of these scripted phrases, and I use many of them, most of them, But a lot of them, when you use them for the first time, they feel weird. They feel kind of unnatural, fake, almost phony. But as you use them, they become very comfortable, very real, very natural. So just be prepared that in the early days, it does feel weird and awkward. But here's some scripted phrases. If your partner is starting to escalate, you can just say, you know what, I'm feeling scared right now. Or, could you please say that more gently? Or, did I do something wrong here? Or, what you just said really hurt my feelings. So again, these are all statements that you've written out, prepared, that you can then just draw on in the middle of a conflict. Or that felt like an insult. Or you know what, right now I'm really feeling sad. So you're just putting words to some of the emotions you're feeling in that conflict. Or what you just said, I'm feeling blamed right now. Could you rephrase it? Or I'm feeling unappreciated. Or what you just said made me feel very defensive. Could you rephrase that? Or What you're saying now, it's feeling like you're just giving me a long lecture and rant. And that is making me feel very uncomfortable and safe. Or, I don't feel like you understand me right now. Or, I'm starting to feel very emotionally overwhelmed, flooded. Or, I'm feeling, by what you just said, very criticized. Could you rephrase that? I'm getting a little worried right now by your emotions Can you make things a bit safer for me? I need to calm down. 
I need things to be calmer right now if I'm going to be able to continue this discussion. Or I'm feeling attacked and I just need your support right now. Or I see your point. Or please just listen to me right now and just focus on trying to understand me. Or I just need you to be able to tell you that tell me that you love me. Or can I have a kiss? Or I just said something I regret. Can I take that back? Or could you just please be a little gentler with me right now? Or I'm really feeling flooded and emotionally dysregulated. Could you just help me calm down a little bit? Or could you just please be quiet for a bit and just please listen? This is really important to me. I just need you to listen. I really need to be able to finish what I'm trying to say. Or my reactions were too extreme. I'm really sorry. I really blew that one. Or let me try again. Or I want to be gentler towards you right now, but I don't know how. Could you please tell me what you hear me saying? Or I can see my part in all of this. Or how how could I make things better in this situation? Could we start all over again and try this argument again? It's not going very well. Or what I hear you saying is, or, you know what, I'm just, I'm really sorry for what I've done, and please forgive me. Or I know this isn't your fault. Or my part in the problem is. So, scripted statements that you just learn over time and you're able to use, those can help in those tense times in a conflict. Okay, another one. When you're in the middle of a conflict, you're focusing on the problem. You're focusing on negative stuff. Often that has a critical part of it. And so it's important at times to have tools in the middle of a conflict when it seems to be breaking down or escalating tools that just stop and validate the progress that is being made. So here's some of the things that you can say. You're starting to convince me. Okay, I'm starting to see your point. Or I agree with this part of what you're saying. I'm getting it. Just that validation can help Everybody regulate a little bit, feel more positive about the discussion, feel we're making progress, there's hope it's going to be resolved. Or you can say, okay, I think I see the issue that we need to compromise about. It's this. Or I think I see here's the area that we have common ground on. Or Okay, I've never thought of things the way you're presenting them. I need to be able to think about that for a little while. But I like, I want to think about that. Or, you know what, maybe I've made too big of a deal out of this and this problem isn't as serious as I thought it was. Or, I'm beginning to think that your view is making a lot of sense. Or, you know what, I'm hearing you I'm not yet convinced, but I'm hearing you, and I think we just both need to take some time to think about it, to inform our views even better. Or, okay, what I'm thankful for in this conflict right now is we've been respectful. We're both trying to understand each other. That's progress. We're approaching it differently than in the past, and I just want to acknowledge that. So all of those things are just helpful validations in the middle of conflict that just help encourage people to keep on going. Then you need tools to help this conflict not turn into something that becomes damaging. Because conflicts, if they keep escalating and there's no resolution, and the escalation just gets higher and higher, at some point, people are going to start to damage each other. And so, here's some phrases again. I might be wrong in this part of the argument. Just being able to own that bit, 
can de-escalate it and stop damage from being done. Or, please, can we just stop for a while? Let's take a break. Give me a moment. I'll be back. Or, okay, before we go any further, let's at this point stop and just agree to disagree. We can come back at a later date, but that's where we have to leave it for today. Or just being honest, okay, I'm really starting to feel emotionally overwhelmed. We, we need to take a break. Or, you know what, let's take a break, and then we need to just start all over again, fresh, brand new, because this is broken down. Or, if you're with your partner and you are making progress, but they're getting tired of how long the process is taking and they're starting to withdraw, to be able to say, hang in there, we're, we're making progress, don't withdraw now, just let's keep going for a little while longer. Or, you know what, we're really starting to get off track. We need to stop. So those are, I hope, very practical tools for beginning a conflict. Before you even start, how you introduce it, getting your emotions regulated. Next week, we're going to look at kind of the process of beginning to figure out how to resolve it, but hopefully that helps you for today. So that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break, then I'm going to come back and do part two which is Christian, spiritual-based. If that's not where you're at, no problem. We'll see you next week. Everybody else will be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. We started a little series that I'm calling Spiritual Bypassing, and it's all about using the spiritual in a way that is misusing it, in a way that tries to make it a magical fix that makes recovery easy, that makes it so you don't have to work as hard as others, so that you don't have to sit in uncomfortable emotions, so that it's not slow or messy. It's just very quick, instant fix. Today I want to take a verse that is often used by some in a way to me that is spiritual bypassing, but it does a ton of damage. It is tragic. And it's Philippians 3, verse 13. And it says this, I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I have heard people use this all the time to say, I shouldn't look at my past. I shouldn't look at my childhood. The past is in the past. I just focus on the future. And this is the verse that they use. What I want to say up front is I want to show you that that is a total misunderstanding, misinterpretation of that verse. And because of that, it has done so much damage to people and hindered their actual healing journey. So let's begin here. If you were to look at the context of this verse, Philippians 3 and look at how the, be, the chapter begins, the previous verses before Paul says this verse. Here's what he says in verse 5 to verse 8. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Here's the key thing. Do you realize what Paul's doing? He's remembering his past. So when Paul then goes to verse 13 and says, I don't look at my past, I forget the past, well, then he can't mean don't remember your past because that's what he's just done. He's just spent time reviewing his past, 
looking at his past, bringing up his past, talking about his past. So verse 13 can never mean don't look backwards, don't look at your past, don't think about your past. It has to mean something totally different. So what then is Paul doing? He is purposely remembering his past, but how is he remembering his past? He's deconstructing it. He says, my whole life, I gained my sense of value from the wrong thing. I gained it from my nationality, from my tribe, from my education, from my rule keeping, from my religious devotion. In other words, he's doing what I do with every client by helping them go through their past to deconstruct it to say, where does your value come from? Did it come from your status, from your nationality, from your money, from your religious zeal? Paul says, that's how I built my life. It's all wrong. He's reviewing his past to find out what was not healthy about his past so he can change it. That is what we all need to do. And so people who say, don't look at your past, they're actually going against what Paul is saying you should do. He is saying, go against your past. So here's what Paul is actually saying. When he says, forget your past, in today's vernacular, vernacular, you would say, oh, I used to get my value from my job and what I do. Ah, forget about it. I'm done with that. That is the wrong way to live. I'm forgetting that as my way of living. Forget about it. Forgetting the past is repenting from the wrong things I did in my past that were unhealthy. That's what forgetting means. It's not don't ever go there in your memory. It's don't do unhealthy anymore. Forget about them. That is what Philippians is saying. Now just to support that. It's interesting to me that Paul, of all the writers in the New Testament, talks about his past more than any other writer. 2 Corinthians is really, in many ways, Paul's autobiography, and he talks about all kinds of things in his past. Galatians, he does the same. So Paul is constantly remembering his past in order to learn from it, in order to show what's not healthy. So Paul in Philippians 3.13, that one verse cannot be saying, don't remember your past. He violates it over and over again. More than that, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and 9, God repeatedly says to Israel, not just once, twice, three times, but over, over, over again, remember your past. Whoa. Whoa. Paul says, forget your past. God repeatedly says, remember your past. Why aren't people talking about that? Why do people focus on that one verse that Paul gives without understanding its context and overlook all the verses where God says, don't forget your past. And as you go back through Deuteronomy, God says, don't forget your past. So you don't forget the lessons you learned. You don't forget all of the stuff you did that were wrong ways of responding. You need to remember your past so you don't repeat it. You need to understand your past so you know what to change. So Deuteronomy hammers that home. Now let me take it further. If you were to say, don't remember your past, then you'd have to get rid of half the Bible. Because what does half the Bible say to Israel? Here's your history, remember your past. And then if you were to go to some of the Psalms, some of the Psalms specifically recount Israel's past in detail in order to lead them to see an insight in order to bring them to a point of realizing a pattern so they can change it. So half of the Bible is about remembering your past. So Philippians 3.13 cannot be saying, don't remember your past. 
If you take that into very practical terms today and say, don't remember your past, what does that mean? I shouldn't remember my child's birthday? Does that mean I shouldn't remember putting my hand on a hot stove? Does that mean then I'm going to repeat putting my hand on a hot stove because I'm supposed to forget all that stuff? It doesn't make sense. It starts to break down. And then you have to go, okay, then why then did God give us a memory? If I'm not supposed to remember my past, then that means I shouldn't remember the good of my past either. You can't just say you can only not remember the bad of your past. And so then it was wrong of me for God to give me a memory he, if he only wants me to think about the future. It all breaks down. And so what I want you to understand is Paul is saying, and the Bible is saying, we need to remember our past. We need to understand how we've responded in unhealthy ways so we can change it, so we can see our patterns. We need to understand the ways we got value in the wrong ways, the ways that we treated others wrongly so we can change it. We're constantly deconstructing our path so we can get healthier, so we can grow. It is absolutely necessary. All that Paul is saying is once we realize what's unhealthy, we say, I'm done with it. I'm going to forget that in the sense of I'm not going to repeat it. That is out of my life. I'm changing. So I'm going to forget living that way. So I hope that helps because I just get heavy hearted at times when I hear people say, oh, I was told I can't look at my past. I shouldn't look at my past based on Philippians 3.13. And I just, my heart breaks because it keeps people from growing. It keeps them in an unhealthy place. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the balance of your word, the fullness of your word. Forgive us for just focusing on one little verse, taking it out of context, misusing it for some agenda that's not healthy at all, and all oh, the damage that it does. And just help people come to clarity in their mind, I pray. Amen. Well, that's the end of another Friday night. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great weekend. We'll see you.